Yes, they can hear us because yeah, it's the like for the broadcast. Uh, so welcome uh, those of you who made it here to the literature house on this super windy day, and uh, also the, to those who are uh, listening or and watching us online. Uh, we have here today uh, our uh, current writer in residence of Tartu City of Literature, Olena Husseinova, and. Uh, we will first uh, watch a video, and after that, uh, I'm going to tell a, couple, uh, a, a bit more uh, about the residency and let Olena uh, introduce herself.
So this was a very powerful video. I actually uh, forgot to ask you also, uh, when was this made? It was made in 2014, in the year of Revolution of Dignity and the year of start of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. And uh, it, uh, the idea was that uh, um, and it won a prize of uh, the only Ukrainian competition of video poetry. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was named the club. And uh, the idea was that uh, video poetry actually always uh, normally, you know, video poetry where you uh, listen to the voice of poet and see some kind of video. And our, uh, this, uh, this artist, Daria Kuznic, idea was that video poetry is also poetry to read. So there is no voice, but there is text which you could read. And um, so it was a long ago, but uh, I still like this way of presenting poetry too. Yes, it's interesting, especially because I don't think we have had many experiences with that kind of uh, well, ways of presenting poetry here in Estonia. So I, I'm, I'm quite surprised to learn that uh, there was even a prize for video. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a fashionable way of uh, making this interactive way of poetry to breathe new life in this old uh, way of uh, fictional speech uh, and I think now it is not so uh, popular as it was 10 years old al almost 10 years ago but it was some kind of experience for all poets in Europe I think yes I'm yeah, I, I, right now I'm very happy that you had this uh, this video and that we could also uh, see it with English translations, uh, those of us who don't understand Ukrainian. Um, today we are going to listen to some of Olena's uh, poems, uh, a selection of them we will also listen in Estonian, uh, namely three poems, poems that have been translated by Maria Kangro, especially for this event. Uh, and then uh, between the readings, we will also talk a bit uh, on different topics, but perhaps first, uh, maybe it would be good to... Um, yeah, I promised to say a couple of words about the residency. Well, Olena is our sixth uh, writer in residence in Tartu. Uh, we began in 2017, but then uh, COVID put us on forced a break for quite a long time, so I'm really happy that this residency program uh, has continued now and that uh, Olena has arrived to talk to as our sixth resident and will stay here until the end of May. But yes, I think maybe uh, to introduce yourself, uh, it would be best if you could say a few words and maybe the best way to introduce a poet is through poetry. Uh, I, first of all, I want to say Tere. Is it okay? Yes. I am right. Very yeah. good pronunciation. Uh, I am not the best. For, uh, I am, uh, people have this talent to learn foreign languages, and I do not have this talent. My husband, when he appeared in a new language uh, atmosphere, he immediately started to say hello, goodbye, thank you in the language of the country. And for me, it's, it's a great problem. But I think that. Uh, a very important thing we have to do, especially when we are in these countries of small languages, as Estonian or Ukrainian is. Countries which has only one country and only one nation and only one people who use this language to express themselves. Uh, so I'm happy to say this Tere uh, for you and I hope in the end of the May I could say some more words. Um, uh, my name is Olena Poseinova, I'm from Ukraine, and uh, this is my first uh, writer's residence uh, because uh, it was an uh, idea, uh, my last idea before the, war, the big war started. I have this dream to come to Tartu because I, um, uh, I find a good idea to write a biographical book about Ukrainian writer 
uh, not very famous in Ukraine uh, from 19th century, uh, who had Pseudo Hritsko Hrikurenko, and her real name was Alexandra Sudovshikova. And she lived 10 years in Tartu, and her first book was published here in Ukrainian. Uh, she is part of family, uh, noble, very famous Ukrainian family, uh, family from which Lesa Ukrainka, for example, or Olena Teliko, Olena Pchilka, or Mikhaila Dragomanov. She is a wife of Lesa Ukrainka husband who studied physics in Tartu University uh, and uh, made his PhD here. So she lived with him. And um, in, in the end of 2021, which was the year of Lesa Ukrainka, and I uh, find this idea that Hritsko Hrikarenko also a very important figure and we should know her biography. And then I made kind of project for Ukrainian Cultural Fund. And it was 12 of February when I sent this application to Ukrainian uh, Cultural Fund. And then in almost 10 days, the big war began and nobody even read this uh, application. And then I saw in during one of my night shifts on Ukrainian radio, I saw this uh, application of the residents, and I decided that uh, Hritsko Hrherenko wanted me to come to Tartu and to write this biography. So here I am. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I have to. I. Uh, I. Uh, my. I have two identities, professional identities. I am a radio host and radio producer, and I am a poet. During the during the war, I started to write also um, non-fictional things like es essays. And I have this big dream to write uh, long uh, prose things, not only short poetry. Um, I have two books, uh, of, two book, uh, poetry collections. And uh, one of them is very beautiful. Unfortunately, I, I uh, forgot that it could be shown with pictures. It's made by the most famous Ukrainian illustrators, Artstudia Grafka. They are, I don't know, probably even some books are translated into Estonian also. And they are real superstars of illustration now, not only in Ukraine, in the world. Uh, they take all prizes which were in Europe and now they take all prizes which are in Asia, uh, which is very close book market space. One of, the, one of my books were made by them and it is called Superheroes and it's like a bit of comics aesthetic, aesthetic of these paintings. And um, for uh, the mo most part of my professional time is is radio. I work on uh, Ukrainian radio. Uh, it's national broadcasting company, and I, uh, I am uh, head of uh, radio theater and literature program department um, in the third radio channel, which is Radio Culture. And from 26 of uh, February, I started a uh, very unusual role for me. I am a radio host on a 24 news marathon of radio version. And uh, this year I lived in um, a way when I have a lot of long uh, live shifts on radio for six year, hours or for 12 hours in the night. And uh, that's, that's, that's the time. That's how it looks now. Well, uh, you almost uh, already uh, <laughs> gave a lot of uh, uh, insight to, to, into what I was going to ask later, but I think we will go come back to these uh, topics, including uh, your work on the radio. But perhaps, I don't know, uh, maybe we should listen to a couple of poems, and then okay. I, I, I'm going to uh, try to I work also, some questions. I also used to, uh, to say sorry for my Ukrainian English, but I have a little joke that my Ukrainian English is almost the same as our president uh, has because we have the same 
teacher of English in the school. But as I listen to, the, the, as I hear him now, uh, he had someone else to 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 to, to, to practice English with him. <laughs> so it was his English like two years ago. Okay. Um, okay. From this one, we will read. One. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I will read uh, one poem, poem now, and I think later we will talk about the uh, topic which explains this poetry. Те, що встигаєш покласти в валізу, загорнути в плівку з повітряних пульбашок, заховати за пазуху, притиснути до себе, те, що закотиться лишиться невидимим під ліжком, під столом, під землею, буде лежати, припадати пилом, вогнем, стане сірим, стане чорним, синій глек, тарілка з фруктами, польові і домашні квіти, затишок, спокій, снач... смачний сніданок, літо в степу, стане крихким, стане сипучим, коні, вершники, буря на морі, вербне неділя – Все зміниться. Місто Одеса і вид на нього. Паризький пейзаж, хати на заході сонця і берег річки. Сонце зникне за горизонтом, і коли твої очі звикнуть до помаранчевого і червоного, ти навпомицьки облупиш, підчистиш, підмиєш. І не впізнаєш те, що завжди було тільки твоє. Uh, and I will uh, read the same poem now in Estonian, uh, translated by Maria Kangro. <clears throat> See, mida sa teha saad, panna kohvrisse, mähkida sisse, mulli kilesse, peita põue, suruda enda vastu. See, mis veerema kipub, jääb nähtamatuks. Voodial, laual, maal, jääb lebama, udeneb tolmuks tules, tõmbub halliks, Tõmbub mustaks, sinine purk, puuviljadalrik, põllu ja aialilled, vaikne rahu, maitsev hommiku söök, suvis tepis, muutub rabedaks, muutub vedelaks. Hobused, ratsanikud, torm merel, merel palmipuude püha, kõik muutub. Odessa linn ja vaade sellele, Pariisi maastik, majad päikese loojangul ja jõekallas. Päike kaob silmapiiri taha, Ja kui su silmad harjuvad, oranji ja punasega, siis kobamisi kooritse selle ära, puhastad ära, pesed ära. Ega tunne ära seda, mis alati oli vaid sinu oma. So, uh, should we read some more or should we go to the I think if discussion? we will start uh, the way you decided to put questions, it okay. will explain yeah. this poetry trip. Good. I'm going to have to yeah, reread this uh, quote because I don't remember it by heart. But um, yeah, uh, anyway, um, I read your interview uh, to Radio Prague International. It was a very interesting uh, interview, especially uh, with uh, some uh, well, general characteristics of, about what is happening in Ukrainian literature now. And uh, among other things, you have said there that, um, and I quote you now, that the common feature in Ukrainian poetry now is that it tends to be very mimesic. Sometimes you can just write down what you are seeing and it sounds like poetry. For instance, when, I'm, when a missile hits a children's playground and you write a simple line about it, it looks like poetry, but it's actually a horrible reality. So I think this is a very interesting characterization and brings out quite a lot of uh, like re-questioning about how we usually talk about poetry and, um, and the, the, this dynamics between the poetic language and, and, and reality is, uh, uh, well, looks in a bit different uh, uh, a bit different way when, when thinking about it like this. So could you also talk about your own writing uh, on the background of, of this idea or this notion? Yeah. I, uh, I liked very much that you started from this citation and from this uh, my recogni uh, my uh, idea that uh, that Ukrainian poetry now is very mimetic. 
And we have such jokes that uh, sometimes life imitate art, not art imitate uh, life. And uh, that's the reality where we are now living. Uh, and it, where everything, what is happen, happen mean right now is very artistic, very horrible and very artistic, almost metaphorical. And I, uh, this poetry, which uh, was uh, read right now, it is about uh, looting and stealing uh, cultural heritage from Kherson Museum. And uh, it is just names of uh, paintings, which we think is disappeared. And it turned in, in, a, in a story when you don't know that it's just names of uh, paintings, uh, it turned in, in a story, in a plot. And I will share with you uh, my experience, which uh, is my experience of evacuation from Kyiv. Uh, I have just 10 minutes to gather my things, but I wasn't uh, at home, so I have nothing to gather. I, uh, it was just my laptop, medicines, and um, and passport. And we sat with my my husband in car and uh, starts this long and very slow, slow, slow trip to uh, west of Ukraine. And we use very uh, narrow uh, roads because it was impossible to go through Zhitomerska. Uh, uh, way because it was already battled. Uh, it, it, it is the main way to from Kiev to uh, West, but it was already uh, dangerous on this way. And we yeah. were moving, it was deep in the night, and we were moving very slowly through this very narrow uh, road, which is village road. And we were not alone. We were one of thousand one of hundreds of thousand cards with lights and inside of these lights i actually remembered my granny who lived through first world war through ukrainian revolution through short time of ukrainian people republic through uh, bolsheviks through uh, Holodomor uh, through the Second World War. And when I was a kid, I asked her, where is all beautiful things which probably my, my grand grandmom has? Where everything rings, uh, some, I don't know, paintings, cups, glasses. And she answered something, but I couldn't understand how it possible that everything is just disappeared, all this private uh, cult heritage. And then inside of this long line of cars, uh, car lights, which is moves very, very slowly, I understand how it's possible because uh, I had nothing. All, all my life with all things were behind and I has no, had no idea whether I will come back. And uh, if just to put it in some way, it could be a poem, it could be some kind of essay, and it could be a start of some novel, for example. But it's just ordinary day. And uh, it's it almost every day you have such an experience, which is very dangerous for sure. And and that's uh, and uh, and and because I think because of such experience, we had a lot of poetry now. Almost everyone writes poetry. PR managers and eco lawyers are poets. Uh, people who write big uh, fantasy novels in Ukrainian, they are poets. Uh, people who uh, were authors of big novels, realistic novels, are poets. Everyone, a lot of people, not of course everyone, but a lot of people, they, they write poetry right now. And, uh, and so it's, it's difficult to... Um, 
to understand what to do with all of this poetry, because there are a great texts, but there are not so great texts. And when I try uh, tried to find an answer yesterday for this question, I understand what happening inside of this process of uh, producing this huge number of po po poetry. Um, the main thing is that we uh, don't have our lives anymore. We don't have our lives. And that, that is the main thing about us and about this poetry. And this poetry is a desire to show this absence and to show it in multiplied voices, this absence of our life. Thank you. I think this was wonderful, but uh, yeah, you also answered one question I didn't uh, put down earlier. Uh, uh, when I was thinking about what, what we should talk about, I actually had this question uh, whether there is a lot of poetry writing in Ukraine right now. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but in a way, uh, the way you explain it, 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 it is also very logical. I mean, uh, another question would be that I think it's way of expressing uh, this, this absence, expressing pain. Um, the other uh, thing would, of course, be what about those reading the poems? I mean, if there's a lot of poetry, this, it's quite obvious that everybody can't read everything. So it's kind of uh, probably very fragmented, this poetry scene. Uh, I... I, I'm not sure, but uh, there are uh, a tendency of making anthologies. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, in, in June, we will have our, uh, we have two big festivals and two big fair, uh, book fairs, one in Lviv and one in Kiev, one in autumn, in autumn in Lviv and one in uh, uh, summer in Kiev. Probably some Estonian writers were uh, whether on Lviv Book Fair or on uh, Kiev Arsenal Book Fair. And uh, we d d didn't have uh, Arsenal last year because of the war, but this year we will have this festival uh, again. And uh, on this festival, I will be a coordinator, producer, curator of uh, radio poetry stand. Uh, uh, it will be for events. Uh, and I try to put uh, uh, the most important issues about uh, contemporary poetry. And one is it's a poetry which is written in front line. We uh, have poets who are uh, in Ukrainian army now, and uh, some of them turn to be poets. They were uh, this echo lawyer about whom I taught he turned to be poet uh, and uh, he is extremely popular and it's impossible to listen to this poetry. It's totally mimetic and it's also with rhymes. And if he used the word generator, he should to find a rhyme for, for generator. And it is, uh, it is very sentimental and, uh, but uh, guys from frontline uh, loves this poetry and it's a lot of poetry about love and about the woman wife who is waiting and they write sms uh, and puzzle vibes using this poetry but we have great uh, poets who find this new way of uh, poetical speech which is uh, which is closely connected with such uh, simple thing as death. And you feel this presence of death of this Tanata things inside this poetry and it changed the way poetry uh, produces. And uh, the other thing is this, uh, uh, which is very important now, I think it's that uh, the most powerful voices are women's voices in poetry. Uh, war is not a women's deal. This construction doesn't work in Ukraine anymore. P 
for example, but uh, girls who write poems are very powerful now. Sometimes because of the experience, uh, for example, probably you know who is Roman Ratushny is, uh, and his mom. He is uh, 25, I think, years old Ukrainian lawyer, young lawyer and activist. And we have, a, it was like a part of joy, joke, but we are, were very serious. We were sure as in, in a couple of years he would be our president. Um, and he was killed by Russian army in uh, summer. Uh, uh, and it was shocked and we were all shocked. It was like, like one of the main points in this war when you understand that such people who were your hope, uh, young and beautiful, and who looks like heroes and who have, uh, who have, who had to live, have to live. You were sure that such people couldn't be killed. They are dying on this war. And his mom is a poet and she write a great book and dedicated it to Roman. And uh, her poet, she, she is a good poet uh, just for a long uh, time. But this experience also changed a lot in her way of uh, way of speech, and that's one case why uh, women's voices are much more powerful now. And um, and also uh, during this uh, arsenal would be presentation of very big anthology where. Uh, the editor of this anthology, Astap Slavinsky, who is also translated into Estonian, he tried to put everything. He tried to put this anthology without uh, criteria, artistic, very much of artistic criteria, just to show what happening inside of the poetry. And I think I will understand uh, much more about what is the situation with contemporary Ukrainian poetry when I will uh, re re will read this anthology. But uh, we have a lot of poetry readings and uh, almost always they are for, uh, for, for, for money. Uh, all poetry readings is a way to collect money for some, uh, something which is important for front line. And uh, I don't know whether it's fragmental I don't know. I, I think we can talk about this maybe in like 40 yeah. years yeah. Or, or something because yeah, you, you would need this uh, perspective too. Yeah. But yeah, it, it was just something that was playing around in my head. That, uh, this, uh, I think it's the uh, future will tell whether uh, uh, which part of this poetry will remain and who will be the readers actually. But, uh, yeah, I think in the same interview, you also mentioned um, when talking about your own writing that um, uh, it, uh, it was sort of when the war began, uh, it was sort of uh, uh, there was insecurity about whether anybody needs poetry anymore at all. And this famous saying that when, uh, uh, that when cannons roar, muses are silent. And um, well, as you said, talked already about uh, working as a radio host and now doing this 24-hour uh, live broadcast. Uh, uh, I was thinking whether this, um, if and how this has affected you as a writer, this, uh, work in the radio, especially during during wartime, reading the news, and uh, and uh, if if it has some kind of dialogue with how you write. Um, I write during my night shifts. That uh, the only time when I write. Because in the beginning, I, I, uh, it turned that I was the only person on 26th of February who was near the evacuated studio. I was just the only person who knows what to do in studio, who could be a radio host. Uh, I wasn't uh, in the uh, number of those who should uh, be uh, the radio host during the war because I, I am a cultural journalist. I don't have this vocabulary to talk about politics 
about economics, about war. And uh, but I I was on the in the radio from the first uh, day, and I just made some small things to help. I made a lot of audio audio instruction what to do in different situation, how to uh, pack uh, for a shelter, how to wear children for shelter, how to what to do with pets in shelter. But also I made two audio one about how to save your library and how to save your family China. And these two audio disappeared from broadcast in the on the second day because it was understandable that that's the last thing we we should, we have time and chance to think about libraries and uh, chains. But nevertheless, it's part of our life. And uh, but when, then we started this evacuation process, and it was difficult and unexpected. And it turned that I am the only person near the studio. So I have this first nine hours uh, of being a radio host and to be, being a voice of Ukrainian radio. And I did everything news, broadcast, weather broadcast and uh, all, all other things. And I am uh, very thankful for radio and for the radio team because immediately I was inside of some, something which is very important. Because almost in a couple of hours, radio appeared to be the only source of communication for occupied villages and cities. And we know such stories that in Mariupol, um, Russians took part of city districts and they were uh, driving on their cars with megaphones and they told that there is no Ukraine anymore, uh, Kyiv is capitulated, so there is Russia and nothing else. And then uh, they find Ukrainian radio and learned from us that it, is, it isn't true. And it was like two months when we work like, like these communicators, like these mediators who, uh, who, it was like, I feel that I have two, a couple of aims. One of them was to announce green corridors. One of them was to announce where you can find in your city drinking water. Uh, another was just to bring voice of your country, just to, to, to bring this feeling that people are not alone. And it, and it was time when we, of course, don't have time to write during the night shifts. But then it, it changed. It changed after uh, the deoccupation of Kyiv and after capitulation of Azovstal. And these shifts become very slow and long. And you still have to be there because in Kherson or in Berdyansk, people listen to Ukrainian radio, radio at night. And it's also, it, already I don't have a useful information for them, not about green corridors or drinking water, but just the sound of voice and language. And um, uh, and after after our return to Kiev, I start to write during night shifts. I have a couple of such things during this first period of time, but the main uh, mass of texts were written during this time, and it was written by hand, and I made it in my notebook where I. Uh, write all this unknown for me vocabulary about politics, war, and so on. And, and I have a lot of uh, not very good thoughts about these poems, whether it is a poetry or I just rewrite the reality. And I talk about this with my friend, Victoria Melina. She is a writer and now she is documenting war crimes, not just writing about documenting war crimes, but uh, she 
research all these places, uh, massive graves or uh, other uh, dangerous places. And uh, she said, but it is a book, Night Shift. It is a book. It is a book about these nights. And then I started to uh, structure all these texts written by hand. And it turned into a book, which is 12 hours of night shifts and is structured like, like this periods of time when you won't sleep, when you awake, when you have to put uh, English news and so on and so forth. And here I am working on this book and it is almost uh, ready to be sent to the illustrator not this great one, but another great Ukrainian illustrator. So I have just, I think, a couple of days to, 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 to work with it. Oh, that's great. I didn't actually, I think we talked about it briefly, but I didn't actually know that you're on the finishing line yeah. of, of yeah. So it's going to be a third that will now. Well, um, I don't know. Should we read something in the middle, or maybe okay. maybe let's listen to some poetry and then go forward with the talk? You want to read some? Oh well, as you want. Uh, uh, how, how you'd prefer? I'm okay. Or we can just continue the talk now okay. and then read because actually you did. Um, Bring out already something that uh, yeah. seemed really important about uh, about this what what you said about the voice on the radio and then we have talked about poetry and we talked about uh, uh, the, the radio and that both of them have this very common thing we cannot get past uh, in uh, in, in a way, uh, uh, you know, the past is uh, is the language itself and as I have understood it uh, it has been a struggle for centuries now, the struggle for the Ukrainian language. Uh, so, um, well, would it be like, how, how do you see, and I, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe it's a bit far-fetched, but uh, looking at the situation now, when the, the, what you said about uh, Ukrainian, uh, well, poets turning all to Ukrainian now, even those who wrote in Russian, let's say before, and um, I don't know, it's maybe far-fetched to say that uh, uh, maybe this war, this struggle for the language is already, in a way, won, if not won, perhaps, then on, the, on, on an irreversible course, I mean, or, or, or something like that. But how would you see the role of literature, the literary scene in that? I think that we have a very uh, typical experience, Estonian, uh, people and Ukrainian people about language. Not the same situation because I don't think that Estonian, uh, that, that Russian Empire had two laws for Estonian language, to forbid Estonian language. Because for Ukraine, uh, uh, Russian Empire in 19th century had two laws which forbid Ukrainian language. It forbid which for it, it, have, it had forbidden uh, publishing, writing, translating, and all other things. Uh, it was impossible to make science in Ukrainian. The, it was like domestic language. And to a language for singing uh, sad and funny songs, somehow. But in this situation, uh, literature, was it it didn't disappear and i think it's some kind of miracle but each generation survived this forbidden uh, things and each generation find the language or construct the language uh, for themselves using of course previous generations experience but they made this like new language, opening of this language. And we also, the generation which survived and uh, started to make their own language. And I still uh, don't know how it happened, 
but uh, I understand it and I think it's also the same for Estonian culture. You could lost your country, you could lost your uh, institution, you could lost your noble people, you could lost almost everything, but if you have language and you have literature, you could survive and start everything again. And, and of course now it's a quite, uh, of course language is a marker and, uh, and, and it, it, is, it is a lot of stories how Ukrainian people who have experience of living in Moscow or uh, having friends or relatives in Russia and then use this Russian uh, Russian Russian language, they survive. And those who couldn't use Russian language very, uh, couldn't use Russian language as it is, they were much more in danger situation. Uh, I think in small uh, colonial countries and in small colonial cultures, cultures language is, uh, is more than just a way of uh, communicating. And literature is more than just uh, art thing. I think it's a place of uh, politics and ideology, a place where identity uh, could survive. Mm -hmm. as, uh, as I understand it also, it's that the, um... Well, uh, we have seen the percentages of how many uh, uh, Ukrainians now who were before bilingual are now switching yeah, yeah. to only Ukrainian. I mean, uh, uh, that's happening because I understand yeah, yeah. the literature. I am well. a person. I I am from, for example, it's a normal situation about uh, bilinguality in Ukraine. Uh, I am from bilingual family, but it is. Uh, it is not original, authentic uh, bilinguality. It is a choice uh, my parents should make, make uh, when they finish their schools. They lived in small cities and it was okay to use Ukrainian in no ordinary life in school. And then you have to uh, make your grown up story. You have to study, to to, to find some kind of profession and then you have to go to a bigger city or in capital. And in, in the capital, you have to choose Russian. If you want to have some kind of career, you, you had to choose. And my parents in 60s, they choose uh, Russian and they uh, left the Ukrainian. And, uh, and uh, for my father left his Ukrainian for his writing and his uh, family things, and my mom, she uh, didn't use Ukrainian until my 20 years. And when I was uh, a young girl, I used Russian language as my normal language in, in ordinary life, but I was sure that once I will uh, turn into Ukrainian. But, and then when I was 20, I understand that this day uh, shouldn't come by itself. I just have to put one day as a day of this term transfer. And I once I wake up in the morning and said, from this day, we will talk in family only in Ukrainian. And we started to talk in Ukrainian, but uh, I never write in Russian. And, uh, <coughs> and it is normal situation for a lot of Ukrainian writers, contemporary writers who use Russian in their ordinary life, in the, in, even in families, but they never uh, write in Russian. And uh, first, we, we have a couple of such situations when, of course, every situation of this transformation and this turn into from, uh, Ukraine, from Russian into Ukrainian was very, uh, very personal. But it was a couple of historical events when it was it has this mass uh, character. It was in 2004 during the Orange after the Orange Revolution. It was of course uh, on 20 
during the 2014, after the revolution of dignity. Of course, it was uh, on, uh, on February of 2022. And we have a joke, I will say it in Ukrainian, then try to translate. Uh, uh, whether it is difficult to turn from uh, Russian into Ukrainian. No, it is very easy. Uh, we legally spied 23 February, and we woke up 24 Lutego. We uh, go to sleep. We went to sleep on 23 of February, but we wake up on 24 of February. In Russian and Ukrainian, February is different. Uh, phonetically and lexically, it is different words, Fevral and Luty. And it was happened in, in two, uh, 2022, it happened immediately. People who had uh, Russian poetry, who write both Russian and um, Ukrainian from my generation, they just forget that they had Russian poetry. And if we have uh, uh, we have such, she's very good poet, she's from Donetsk, and she write in uh, Russian before the revolution of dignity, then she started to, uh, to use Ukrainian sometimes. And now if you try to remember her Russian poem, poems, she will be very angry. <laughs> and, and she always, she tried to explain for her Russian colleagues that uh, her Russian language was not the language of choice, but the language of metropoly, uh, which, uh, uh, which was presented for her as a language for writing poetry. And she should go from, through all the things, through uh, losing her how, home in Donetsk, through uh, losing her uh, her ordinary life, which she tried to make during eight years because of a uh, big war. And now just to know that Ukrainian is a language of her poetry. Her name is Ia Kiva and she is, I think she is also translated into Estonia. And she is, uh, it's, she is a great, it's, she's a very good poet and her story is a very uh, good story to explain what happened about Ukrainian language in Ukraine. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I th yeah, I thought that. Yeah, actually, mm, you already also talked about your research here and uh, uh, I'm going to do the Estonian uh, transcription pronunciation because otherwise I yeah. mess something up. But in Estonian, I think the correct uh, the transcription would be Kritsko Grigorenko, but uh, in Ukrainian, Kritsko. Uh, but yeah. but I like Estonian. Like yeah. Well, I was looking, well, doing research, there's almost nothing in Estonian language about uh, her. Uh, this really brief, um, I have to give you this link, I found them. An article um, in this uh, historical magazine, Ayalooli Nayakere, uh, that's written by Sergei Isakov, uh, who has studied the like, uh, different uh, uh, national groups at Tartu University in the late 19th century, and he mentions her. So that's wh where I got the uh, transcription. But um, uh, you already told us a bit about her, but there's also something you told me uh, earlier about um, her work and uh, this thing with language that was really interesting for me. I am not sure that I'm uh, right, but I try to uh, explain mm -hmm. this story now. Um, uh, Shura Sudovshikova uh, is one of the represent good representer of this uh, generation. This generation of Lesia Ukrainka, but Lesia Ukrainka is extraordinary figure. And she is such a powerful figure that uh, everyone else in, is in the shadow of her. But she is a part of a, a, a big generation which were almost artificially made by their parents. Their parents decided that they should be Ukrainian intellectuals and they should speak right uh, Ukrainian, that they should wear Ukrainian clothes, that they should uh, 
feel themselves as a part of Europe and so on and so forth. And they were made to be such a generation. And Lesa Ukrainka and her brother and uh, brothers and sisters were part of this generation. And uh, Shura, Shura Sudovshikova also. Uh, her father was a Ukrainian professor and he was exiled uh, to Russia for anti-Tsarist activity some kind and it, it was easy to do such activity in 19th century if you just uh, speak in classroom in Ukrainian you are already the enemy of uh, regime so he was uh, exiled to Russia and there he died because of bad climate a lot of people died in Russia because of bad climate it's a normal thing about Russia and um, her mother returned to Ukraine and uh, Mikhailo Dragomanov, who was a friend of uh, uh, Shura's father's uh, father, uh, helped them. She lived in his house. But uh, Mikhailo Dragomanov was a uh, 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 Russian empire, took away from him Russian citizenship, and uh, he should go to immigration to Zurich. And he is a social philosopher and also probably he he is even he was even a political scientist and he is uh, um, and uh, because of him because of uh, this he, uh, Russian empire um, invented such a phrase very popular, and it is very popular, I think, even now, Malorossijski uh, Gadosti. Uh, Malorossijski, it's uh, <coughs> they, they called Ukraine Malorossia, and Gadosti is nastiness. And it's because of his Ukrainian issues with which uh, about, uh, because of all things he tried to do for Ukrainian culture, about his, he works with history, geography, and with folklore. He was sent away from Russia Empire, from Ukraine, of course, and he lived in Zurich. And uh, in Zurich, he met a lot of uh, Russian radicals. And until today, all liberal ideas Russians produces, uh, they were taught these I liberal ideas in Zurich by Mikhail Dragomanov. And uh, so, when he moved from uh, Ukraine to Zurich, uh, Shura and her mother uh, became a part of this lesser Ukrainka family. And Shura uh, fell in love with Mikhail uh, Kosach, uh, old, elder brother of lesser Ukrainka, and he also, and they married. And in, uh, uh, in 1892, uh, Mikhail was here as a student, and uh, Shura came to him, and uh, Tartu was the city where her daughter were born, was born, and her first book was published. And I find this book, and uh, also it is time when Emsk uh, lore is uh, actually worked and it wasn't possible to publish Ukrainian book in Russian Empire. But I find this book in here in library, and it is published with, it is published, it is Ukrainian, syntaxes, grammar, uh, lexics, but uh, all Ukrainians um, vocal are Russian vocal, like E, E, and so on. And I still, don't know how it works. I have, uh, and it has this mark that censor said that everything is okay with this book. And this is this book is about uh, it is um, it is made in the way Zala writes. It is it is naturalistic uh, short uh, stories about Ukrainian uh, village people peasants, and it is uh, totally not. Um, rustical way of uh, uh, of 
uh, speaking about of demonstrating the, this village life. There is no poor uh, village people who are struggling and so on and so forth. They are well enough, but they are uh, but they they are okay with their um, food and their money, but they are less of ethical things, like less of this inner inner life. And uh, there are a lot of this uh, naturalistic explanation of their uh, life stories. And it is very close to how Zala was writing. And of course, he was very popular in this time. And uh, I don't, and it is, it is absolutely the book which Emsk lore uh, forbid. And I don't know how they managed to find this uh, thing that censor said it is okay, uh, because they pretend it is written in Russian because of these Russian letters, or because they pay for it, for example. Uh, and I think that's uh, the story I should research and explain. But I think that I thought I, I work a lot um, uh, in Tartu and I am alone in this working. And I thought a lot about uh, Shura, about Hvitsko Hrehorenko, because these 10 years, I am sure, was the happiest years of her, because they moved, uh, they returned, they moved to Kharkiv from uh, Tartu in uh, 1902. And in 1903, Mikhail uh, died from dysenteria because it was a brilliant, happy 19th century and everyone easily died because of dysenteria. And, uh, and her best years and best time were, uh, was here. And I tried to find this atmosphere of her best and happiest years. And I have an idea that I will read Russian newspapers on this time, and I will find an, an atmosphere of the city. And I read three years, um, uh, 19, 1892, 1893, 1894, and it was two Russian newspapers, Derpsky Listok and another one, and I was so frustrated after reading of these newspapers because there is no city, there is no atmosphere, there is no Estonia, there is no Tartu. It looks like propaganda newspaper from Berdyansk. I, I, I saw these newspapers from Berdyansk, they absolutely the same. The main topic is uh, that how happy Estonian people are because they could learn Russian and find a lot of possibilities. The another main thing is what to do with Estonian children because they are so un. They are. They couldn't. Uh, they couldn't behave properly. They can't make. Have, uh, uh, they can't make properly, uh, they can't uh, greet properly their Russian educators. And they're very impolite. Yeah, they're yeah. very impolite, yeah. And uh, the other thing, uh, and there is no, and, uh, and uh, the long, long article, how happy Estonian people, because Brazil of Imperator is, uh, came to, to Tartu. There is no city. There is no people, there is no ordinary life. It's like a propaganda vacuum. And I find, uh, and I understand that in the end of the newspaper, it should be a advertisements. And advertisements, it's a real life. It's an ordinary life. It's food, uh, uh, I don't know, every, everything which is normal life is it, and uh, atmosphere is. And I find a couple of advertisements and it was two of them. One was about Russian champagne. I couldn't imagine a person who wanted to drink Russian champagne in 19th century. 
now also, but in the 19th century, it's impossible to imagine this person. And another about Russian perfumes. Uh, and it's like, I, I was very frustrated and, uh, and, and I, have, I have this feeling that I couldn't reach this uh, city of Hrytsko uh, Hrychorenka. And, and so the, my idea is that I will read newspapers, uh, Russian newspapers, and find uh, Tarto of 19th century is failed. And now I am in a searching of a new wave of getting this atmosphere of Tarto. Well, I guess there are some ways to go around the <laughs> <laughs> Russian newspapers, but uh, it's it's quite a difficult task uh, what to uh, what to take on. But uh, then again, as uh, as I've understood from some bits and pieces you have told me already, you have found out also quite a lot uh, and also things I as a well life of the citizen of Tartu didn't know about, for example, that the, in the same part of the town where you're staying in Tartu, in Sukbilin, uh, that was the place where the Ukrainian community lived. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know whether they, I yet don't know whether they lived there, but, uh, but uh, I, it was like for a week of my first week in Tartu, and I uh, go through one uh, street, it's almost next street to, to, to my street. And I saw a beautiful uh, building with beautiful red color. And I saw this desk, which said what something important about this, uh, this building. And I read all such desks through my way. And this building was like in the opposite side every time. And I, uh, each day I, uh, go, I, I met this, I see this, saw this building, I decided that yesterday, I, tomorrow, I will check tomorrow. And then this tom tomorrow uh, happened and I read what, uh, what it was. It was a house where Ukrainian students gathered and they made this illegal uh, Ukrainian community because this community was illegal in this time and they had theater and they had uh, some some other uh, mm -hmm. some other artistic things and it was forbidden and I also thought about this when I read these Russian newspapers that life was around this propaganda vacuum and they uh, even if they know about such illegal things because they used to know such illegal uh, things they never will put them anyway else except their rapports. It, it shouldn't be in newspapers, but of course it, it is somewhere in Moscow in some kind of rapports about life in Tartu. Well, quite probably, at least about this, uh, all this uh, yeah. illegal institution. Like, I guess, was it the street that's with uphill? Uh, uh, or, or was it parallel? Because, yeah, I, I figure it should be that street because the lower part of Sopelin was quite slum in the 19th century. And, uh, but uh, yeah, in that yeah, there are a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I could be it. So, but maybe somebody from the audience wants to ask something, comment on something. Here. Ah, yeah, it's, it's the red building. Yeah. Do yeah. you know what, what's the name of the street? Uh, what, what street? It's, it's that there, that there street. It's like a process with the street, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, or do we have any questions from the feed? Well, <coughs> I have. I have uh, I'm all I'm all about the Kuritus of Koran and Valamika Kutsuna, Dini Messi. Yeah, yeah. No, Palio don't hang it. Unfortunately, many people are uh, sick <laughs> at this point. So, uh, but yeah. If you don't have questions now, we can perhaps listen to some more poems and then we can continue in more free form uh, next door. And uh, if anybody can uh, wants to question or comment anything uh, when, uh, after watching uh, the live stream or uh, even after like, uh, watching it later, uh, you can always write to us and I will make sure that Olena will get the questions. So. 
and you suffer a little bit because of my horrible Ukrainian English. I think it's very important. I um, I, work a, I I worked a lot in lib university library, and uh, I like how it is structured. That I could just walk around and take books, and I find a big shelf with books about uh, Russian culture in in Tartu, and I do not see such shelf about Ukrainian. Uh, culture in Tartu, but we have a lot of stories. For example, uh, Askania Nova, which is occupied now, it's a unique dendra park uh, with unique uh, flora and fauna, and it's absolutely a mythological place in the total step uh, with such animals which are that which which there, there, which doesn't exist anywhere except Askania Nova. It is occupied now, and we don't know what would be with uh, this place because uh, administration uh, scientists they uh, they stayed in Askania as long it, as it was possible, and now they should uh, ev evacuate to from Askania, and there is no. Uh, th there is someone, but there is no this great scientist who know how it works. And the person who um, founded this place, uh, he is not Ukrainian, but he made this place for Ukraine. Uh, for its fame, he studies in Tartu University, and he studies uh, his his speciality was how to make such place, and that's great connection between Tartu as a uh, 
um, educational city of the students of the university, and uh, Ascania Nova is a unique place. And uh, to be back to our president, who is from Krivirich as well as I am, uh, the person who founded uh, this industrial things in Krivirich also studies this industrial things in Tartu University, Alexander Pol. So we really has a lot of uh, plots, a lot of um, narrations and stories which should be told. And I hope I will try to tell a couple of them after this residence. <coughs> it's, uh, it's something that I think we here in Estonia and in Tartu also don't know about a lot, yeah. but it's, it's, it's been interesting to observe how many of these small connections will surface uh, if you will put together two uh, places or, or, or two culture, uh, two knowledge of two different cultures. Any other comments or questions? If I might ask, do you sometimes meet the boys during these um, matches? Because the people who listen to you during night time or just some practice? Yeah, I, I was listening to Maria when she said that it's a typical phrase about uh, muse which are silent and poetry which couldn't be written after the Holocaust. But I know that uh, poetry helps to survive. I have a real story about first, uh, uh, 9 of March is a uh, birthday of Taras Shevchenko, the great Ukrainian poet, the poet uh, who is known for everyone and, and just the main poet of the tradition, poetry tradition. And it's always, it's a great day when we read a lot of poetry, made some kind of project. <coughs> and it was very close to the beginning of war time, big war time, and we don't have a lot of opportunities to make some, something great. But we made a couple of things. Uh, we, a lot of Ukrainian writers, artists, uh, pop songers, and so on, they, uh, read Trashevchenko uh, on the dictaphones on telephones and sent to us and we put it uh, on our broadcast during 9 of March and March and also we just read uh, during the whole day we, we read a lot of poetry and I made this collection because it is my expertise not politics and not war and it was my expertise and I made this collection of poetry which will uh, which should sound uh, uh, like 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 about the present time, and I have a letter from one girl from Bucha, uh, who was in this time in in, in Bucha in her flat, and what, it was time when our artillery made this fire, and it was impossible to stand up, and she lied on her floor during twelve hours. With, uh, with her phone and radio, and she listened to, uh, to our voices. And we read Taras Shevchenko all the time. And she said that I, I turned, I, I managed not to, uh, to, be, to lost my mind just because I was listening to the poetry. And also, and it's it's all it's it sounds like a story from a bad, bad film about war, but it's not a bad film about war. It's a reality. And also, uh, my one of my colleague uh, in this first part of the, of the night shifts in evacuation, we worked in pairs during the night. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Roman Koleda, he is also a composer and a piano, uh, piano, pia, piano, pianist. Piano, pianist, player, yeah. piano player. And he find uh, some kind of piano and uh, in uh, 15 minutes before midnight, we made such uh, performance on radio. It was uh, our way of lullaby he played his music and I read different poems, not mine, but different Ukrainian and translated poems. And it was also some, 
some something which wasn't very uh, important. It 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 it, it, it this. 15 minutes of music of poetry wasn't an uh, a green announcing of green corridors or some important news but it was something which helps which something which helped people not to lost their minds and to feel that that someone is talking to you someone is close to you Well, let's hear some more poetry. Поки тебе не було, озеро біля дому стало мілким, наче воді теж довелось виїздити, залишаючи все своє найдорожче. Рязку, папорок, іриси не було часу спакувати. Золоті рибки і коропи відмовились їхати, притулилися животами до гравію на дні і не зрушили з місця. Тритони ще спали і сподівалися прокинутися після перемоги. Небо над ними трималося вогняним і гарячим, поки тебе не було. Ти задираєш голову, дивишся на небо, синє, ламке. Біла лінія горизонту стає зеленою. Ти примружуєш око, лінія горизонту підіймається над рівнем заплави. Все на своїх місцях. Лощений посуд, уламок глиняного грузила, залізний риволовний гачок, скляні намистини, античні амфори, залізнична станція, автомобільна дорога, тетерів, стугна, ірпінь. Ти заплющуєш очі, вдихаєш дух з мілілого озера і бачиш. Ось Кирило Кожум'яка ловить голими руками змія людожера, запрягає його у плуг. І ори київську землю. Виростають вали, виростає твоя лінія горизонту, яка не рухалась, тільки міняла колір, поки тебе не було. Селлал, кой син полнут, кей ерв мая юрес мадараks. Юст кой виикс ка веси ера минна, ятас маха койк, мис талле койке каллим. Lemleid sõna ja arvku võhumõõku, polnud aega pakkida, kuldkalad ja karkkalad keeldusid sõitmast, konutasid põhjas, kõht vastu kruusab, ega liikunud paigast. Vesilikud magasid veel ja loodsid ärgata pärast võitu. Taevas nende kohal püüsis leegitseva ja kuumana, sellal kui sind polnud. Sa tõstad pea, vaatad taevasse, sinisesse, haprasse. Valge joon silmapiiril muutub roheliseks. Kissitad silmi, joon horisontil kerkib ülehõjutuse tasemest kõrgemale. Kõik on omal kohal, klasuuritud nõud, savistetud raskuspea kild, rauhas tõngekongs, klaashelmed, antiiksed amforad, raute ja maantee, teteriv, stuhna, irpin. Sa sulged silmad, hingad sisse, julge järve hinge ja näed Vaatkus, kõrloogosu maika peab paljaste kätega kinni inimsööri ja mao ja rakendab ta adraete ja künnab kiievi alad üles. Kerkivad vallid, kerkib su silmapiir, mis ei liikunud, vaid ainult, vaid vahetas ainult värvi sellel kui siin polnud. Can I ask a question? How Kirila Kozumjaka is translated? Kozumjaka, it was my pronunciation mistake. Yeah, that was just... Because I thought yep. that uh, probably it is something equal in uh, something equal mythological plot in yeah. uh, Estonia. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually know the name, but it's uh, in a text, and I, I didn't actually have time to reread those uh, poems, those translations several times. So it sort of surprised me in the middle of the text. <laughs> okay, I can't make it really fast. So yeah, it was it was my mistake, but uh, it, it's uh, well translated. You can see. Basically, here, girl, yeah. uh, Kozumiaka, uh, Kozumiaka, sorry. So yeah, it's, it's I, I they switch to like English to Estonian and suddenly see a, a, a different uh, phonetical construction. It's like, how should I pronounce it? I think I will do my, I didn't find a way to do the same with Estonian uh, mythological person. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it should be the last poem in the book. And it should be the only poem where I use the word war. У війни свої примхи, ходити голою, їсти руками, верещати. Я б одягла її у свою найкращу сукню, нагодувала б її з руки, затулила б її рота, розтягнула б її по бюро знахідок центрального вокзалу метрополітену МВС, забула б її. Там, де ніхто не побачить, ніхто не почує, вона битиметься об стіни сталеві. Востритиме тіло об камінь точильний, з'їсть усі сутінки і світанки. Але я дивлюсь на голе тіло, брудні руки, червону гортань. У мене свої примхи, вколоти її у серце, гострою наче ніч, яка починається у восьмій вечора шпилькою, побачити, як чорна кров заливає їй очі, почути, як вона говорить мені «Я боюсь тебе». Sõjal on omad veidrused. Alasti ringi käia, kätega süüa, karjuda. Mina paneksin talle selga oma parima kleidi. Toideksin teda peost, paneksin talle käes uu ette, tiriksin ta kaotatud asjade kontorisse, peakakselisse, metroosse. Siseministeriumi unustaksin ta. Seal, kus keegi ei näe, keegi ei kuule, hakkab ta peksma vastu terasseinu, Ihub kehad erituskivil, sööb ära kõik videvikud ja koidikud. Aga mina vaatan alasti keha, määrdunud käsi, punast kõri. Minul on omad veidlused. Pussitada teda südamesse. Teravalt nagu öö, mis algab kell kaheksa õhtul. Nagu nööb nõel. Näha, kuidas must veri valgub ta silmadesse. Kuulda, kuidas ta mulle ütleb. Ma kardan sind. Thank you, Alena. And thank you, everybody, for listening, for keeping up with us. It was quite a long talk, apparently, we had. Uh, but now we can, if we have something left to discuss, we can go to the next room and have some free conversation. Back.